Hello, hello. Good morning. Um, so excited to be with you guys today. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the whole week of. Oh, great. Yeah. Hello, hello. Great. Um, hope you've enjoyed the week of um, learning about machine learning and uh, are excited to kind of continue that learning journey um, beyond this week. Um, yeah, so uh, just to reintroduce myself, I'm Kate. Uh, as we said, I've, I'm a research engineer at DeepMind, uh, and I've been there for about five years now. And I feel like yesterday and today I've been reflecting a lot on how much has actually changed in the last five years. And um, when I started doing research, was looking at specifically, and still am a lot, looking at reinforcement learning. Um, but a lot of the questions and a lot of the um, things that we were always hoping for and kind of talking philosophically about are things that we're actually able to do in certain applications now, and a lot of things just work. Um, so it's a really, really great time to be involved in machine learning. Um, uh, specifically, uh, I've always been interested in looking at um, how do we get you know, agents that are you know, doing the dream, general reinforcement learning, having knowledge that transfers um, to different tasks so that you're not just learning one thing, but you're learning a general um, suite of knowledge. And what we would always say kind of um, back in the day when we were working in um, a lot of simulated environments to study these techniques for um, reinforcement learning was we were, we're looking for and, and trying to build these environments um, which have properties of the real world um, that we can leverage to um, build these open-ended kind of uh, general policies. Um, and a lot of the, the struggle was kind of trying to build that. And then um, that's actually what led me to looking at code generation um, because uh, we're now in this regime where we can ask a lot of these questions in um, not only a domain that is in the real world and fits all of these properties that, that have this kind of um, property of the general knowledge transfer, which we'll get into a little bit, um, but also have real world applications that we can um, can, can affect real users now. Um, so without further ado, let's get a little bit into the talk. This works. There we go. Um, yeah, so today we're talking about code generation, but I hope this will serve as a useful uh, lens through which to kind of put together a lot of the stuff uh, from this week um, and looking at kind of generally how do we approach machine learning problems um, for a real-world application? What are the knobs that we can turn uh, strategically? Like, where can we get data? What can we do if we don't have it? Um, and, and how can we measure our success and define the problem in a way that allows us to make progress? So first of all, why code generation? I kind of touched on this already a little bit, but and maybe maybe one of the first ones, one of the obvious ones, is the kind of economic utility of software engineering. Um, uh, software engineering is a $700 billion US dollar um, global industry uh, as of 2024, um, which is just you know, an unfathomable amount. Um, and so if you like money, then that's great. Um, uh, and you know, but what this really says to me is that uh, code generation and software engineering uh, is something that's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It um, touches every corner of our lives. And people find it useful enough um, that this is you know, what's going on every single day. Um, and that's because code is not just the text in the terminal window. So we call it code precisely because um, it translates to some measurable, observable, executable outcome. And this is in some sense true of all language. Language is language because it, it is um, symbols that represent something in the real world. Um, but code has the special property that we can immediately see the outcome um, and we have representations of, of what this code means and what this code does and we can leverage that uh, in a lot of really interesting ways when we're talking about building models uh, to do this. Um, and so this is not only what makes code economically useful, um, but it also provides signals that we as machine learning practitioners can take advantage of when we're trying to optimize signals or create data or find data. And there's a lot of structure that we can leverage there. Um, so that's one of the most exciting things. And then code is this modular, rich, infinite, and open-ended space. So um, there's infinite possibilities of things that we can do with 
code. Um, and code um, starts from a number of these core regularities and rules, and from that expands this ginormous amount of complexity. Um, and that's the property of the real world that I was talking about that allows us to create knowledge because we can um, find these regularities and capture them and transfer that knowledge to doing something else. Um, so we kind of have the potential to pr truly try a lot of these research ideas towards artificial general intelligence that, um, that we've always dreamed about. And maybe the most sci-fi of the kind of uh, reasons and one of the super exciting things is the better that our models become at writing code, uh, the more we can leverage that to building the next generation of models. Um, so the, you know, the extreme end of that spectrum looks like you know, this kind of maybe provocative picture that I put here of um, a model writing its own source code directly and continually optimizing itself. Um, but that also looks like um, taking out certain stages of the pipeline that are very tedious to do uh, or that would help things scale a lot more. For example, writing code to serve as uh, executable verifiers for other language tasks um, or simply can help uh, AI developers uh, along their journey with you know, documentation lookup or helping to write code um, faster and more efficiently. And I've got this quote from Steve Jobs here, um, which kind of elucidates one of the other reasons that everybody should learn to program a computer because uh, it teaches you how to think. And that's true for you and me, but that's also true for um, our, our models and um, the fact that learning how to write correct code forces you um, to reason properly. It forces you to be logical in your thinking and to enumerate um, what, what it is that you're actually doing. And so just one more time before I get into the actual kind of details, the special properties of code that we're going to see that we're going to leverage a lot during this talk um, and why code uh, it, to me is quite interesting to work on um, is I think the biggest one is that it can be executed and you can use the feedback and that kind of rich feedback from executing code in so many different ways, um, from evaluations to training signals to data generation and data filtering. Um, and um, finally, that because it's represented on the computer in a certain way, you have multiple layers of representation that you can use um, depending on what your goal is. So for example, uh, any piece of code can be um, translated to, to an abstract, abstract syntax tree, uh, which is kind of describing the core elements of what's really going on in that um, piece of code. So imagine you are an interviewer and you want to know what the person in front of you has done. And you say, so tell me about your experience at your last job. And they say, oh, I wrote code. They haven't really told you much about what they've done. And that's because code generation is such a broad space. Code can be done for anything. And there's a million different things that people mean when they talk about code generation. Um, and so I haven't really enumerated what I mean when I'm talking about code generation. So um, your next questions might be something like, OK, well, what did you write code for? What was the purpose of that code? Um, what language were you using? Uh, what kinds of tasks? There's all these different steps in the software engineering process. Um, like, you know, the most obvious one is I tell you, you know, what, what kind of code to write. Um, it should do this, it should have these properties, and then you translate that into code. But you can also um, think about all of the other things that uh, when you write code that you have to do, like debugging, going from a failed piece of code to um, a, a one that's passing all of your tests, or uh, documentation, code explanation. Um, refactoring, test generation. Um, so there's all these different steps of the process. Um, and mostly what I mean by code generation is the, the, the first thing, and uh, um, this is generating functionally correct code based off of some functional specification. Um, so that functional specification can look like a natural language sentence of um, exactly uh, what, what we want, and it can even be you know, slightly ambiguous sometimes, so that's something that we'll have to tackle. Um, it, perhaps a bit more of a structured way of representing this would be if I give you, like, say, a code signature, a function header, and tell you, um, you know, with, with a doc string what, uh, what this function should do, and then I say, okay, finish this function uh, based off of these parameters, and it should output a Boolean. Um, I could also 
write code in a, a one language and then have you translate it to another another language. That's uh, another functional specification. Um, or we can do something like test-driven development where I write a test that has all of the behaviors that I might want to um, look at, and then you have to come up with a function that um, meets those standards. Um, this one can be a bit tricky because um, a lot of the times it's really hard to actually um, uh, write down everything that we mean when we're talking about a function. And so if you're not careful, then sometimes test cases are things that can be um, hacked. Um, and then finally, um, the, the one that I was talking about earlier of, of fixing errors. Um, now the actual purpose of the code, the functional specification is maybe implicit in like what's, what's going on in the rest of the code um, and the fact that something is clearly going wrong. So there's kind of two you know, specifications there. One is fix the error, but the implicit one is the whatever the purpose of the initial code was. Now to kind of um, lay this out just a little bit more, um, I always like to think of things in what are the axes that we can um, kind of uh, pull t to, um, to you know, create data or uh, when we're looking at measuring capabilities, what are the different kind of, what's the Cartesian products? Like what is the space that we're looking at here? Um, and although we are talking about this kind of general space of code generation, I think it's really important to um, enumerate a lot of the time what we mean because then we can do things like uh, measure it um, and make sure that we're not focusing only on one particular area and expecting that to transfer to some other area. So um, the, the first one is the structure of the code snippet to generate. Are you generating a single line of code? Are you generating a few lines of code or an entire function or a, you know, a class, a file, uh, a full repository? Um, are you generating contiguous code or are you generating some sort of, sort of like patch or a diff that should work with an existing repository and you're changing that code in some way? Um, the language or programming environment, that one's fairly easy. You, know, you have your language, but you also have uh, potential uh, imports or libraries that you're relying on that you want to be able to, um, your model to be able to use. Um, and then what is the definition of correctness in this space and how are we measuring that? So um, as I was talking about before, usually this has to do with what happens when we run the code? Most often, that's what we're going to be talking about. Is like the code is correct because it did the right thing when I ran it. Um, but this also could um, regard, you know, something like human likability or style. Um, in so, for example, in in, um, in IDE uh, code completion, where you're trying to, you know, create suggestions, um, it could look like what is um, the most useful thing for uh, me to suggest to a human as uh, they're writing their code. And so the functional specification in there and the, and the way that we know it's correct is whether or not the human accepted it and found it useful over a longer period of time. Uh, and then how do we actually verify this correctness? Are we looking at human judgment? Are we looking at um, you know, test cases that are kind of human judgment distilled into um, a very particular format? And then finally, we, we saw this on the last slide, how is the problem specified? Is it natural language? Is it a doc string? Is it a code signature? Um, is there some code context? Um, so this is kind of the space of tasks that we're looking at that we want to be able to solve. Um, and so keeping these in mind as we go through, uh, we'll look at some case studies along the way of the presentation um, that have different flavors of these, these things. So on to evaluation. So, um, I used to think that evaluations was maybe some of like the most boring part of the, um, the pipeline. You want to get to like building the models that can solve the thing. Um, but evaluations is actually, I would say, like one of the most impactful um, things you can do because if you can't measure something, um, you're not going to be able to optimize it. And um, if you can't define what you care about. So um, looking at code evaluations, there's a lot of different ways that we can judge correctness and none of them are um, perfect, but I think um, together we can um, come up with ways for different types of code to judge the correctness of this. Um, so um, throughout this talk, a lot of uh, what you'll realize is that you know code generation, code is just language, right? So a lot of the methods end up being very similar to a lot of other uh, language methods, um, but have some uh, special extras and some, some things that you can leverage. So on this slide, um, we've got a, a few things um, that are used widely for all language, uh, maybe with a, a couple of tweaks. And then the one on the right, this kind of execution test cases is uh, specific to code generation. So the first one, human judgment, I, um, 
I asked Gemini to make me this chess game in Python, um, and then uh, I have a link here. I probably won't open it to not mess with the technical things, um, but it, it actually outputted like a really, really, really long class of chess game, and I, I couldn't tell, like, is this right? I would have to kind of um, run it to find out. So human judgment, especially in the way that we talk about it a lot of the times with human raters for language models, um, it's a very tedious task to ask them to do, and not every human has that kind of expertise or the time or the bandwidth or the kind of energy to look through and code review uh, every piece of code written by a model. And um, especially when we train our models with things like RLHF, uh, what, what I've noticed working with code generation models a lot is that sometimes you ask for something and it's, it looks so right because it, it was trained with a signal of a human saying, yes, make it look good to me on first glance. Um, and so if you do that enough, then you're actually fooling yourself with, um, with thinking that it, it's correct uh, if you're just kind of um, looking at something outright. So human judgment is actually really hard to get right in this case, very tedious, and, and humans uh, are known to make a lot of mistakes when looking at uh, code um, because it's a very mentally intensive task to tell if something is correct or not. Now this extends also to model judgment. Maybe in, 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 in this case we get away from some of the tediousness of um, the human fatigue of looking at something for so long. Um, and in this case I pasted the, the code back into another instance of the model and I said, you know, find any bugs in this code. Um, and I actually was able to point out some interesting things that I hadn't um, noticed in the first pass, like mostly s somewhat surface level things of um, inconsistent indentation or um, some stylistic things, but also looking at um, edge cases, like there's a potential infinite loop in one of these methods. Um, there is uh, something that you're not fully capturing the notion of what chess is um, because there is incomplete castling rights implementation. I don't actually play chess really, so I don't know what that means. Um, and so, so we get a little bit further here, but we're still bound by um, what the, you know, the knowledge inside of the model. Um, and we would still need to train the model um, beyond this to, to, to capture these kind of logical inconsistencies um, beyond that. So model judgment is, is um, I think, a really great thing to use. Um, another thing that is um, sometimes used in language modeling um, are these kind of automated reference-based, reference solution-based reference solution metrics. Um, so I have a good implementation, uh, and given that that's like a good implementation, how good is this other implementation? Um, how close is it? And this can be really difficult in any language, but especially with code where, you know, there's so many different ways that you can um, achieve the same functionality. Um, and so um, there's this uh, metric called blue, um, which is basically looking at a weighting of common n-grams, so basically like how many um, uh, sliding window you know, token sequences do these two um, solutions have in common. Um, and that can get you somewhere, but obviously, especially in code, you're not necessarily using the same words. So there's a couple of um, uh, iterations on this. So there's a metric called code blue, um, which extends blue to also inject the code syntax via an abstra abstract syntax tree and data flow, so looking at another representation of the piece of code to see um, it, maybe that is a more fundamental representation of what this is actually doing. Um, and um, that's more comparable between different um, solutions. Uh, this only gets you so far though because there are completely different like algorithms that move your data in, in very different ways but then end up achieving the same results. Um, and so say your solution, it, your reference solution is um, good, but it's like maybe a brute force way of doing something. Uh, this might not necessarily find the difference in the algorithm. Um, it, it might penalize um, for that, actually, if, even if the um, model solution is better. Um, and then there's another metric called BERT score, um, which again, this is something that's used um, outside of code generation, um, which is basically a similarity metric between the embeddings of the tokens uh, in some transformer space um, between um, these two solutions. Um, so what that does is the, the, um, the model is a pre-trained model, so it has um, understanding of uh, how the context relates to um, the tokens. And uh, if the, that model's understanding of um, 
one solution is very similar to another, then maybe they're actually um, quite similar. Um, and then there was an update on, on, on this specifically for code uh, called code birth score, which uses models, one trained specifically for code, which we'll get into code specialist models in a little bit, um, but also includes um, some other you know, tweaks to make this work well, like um, including the natural language specification in this embedding um, so that um, your representation is more about how the code relates to the functional specification. And that way, um, you can um, look at the, the difference between how my reference solutions code relates to the specification versus my model generated codes. Um, you can get maybe more rich signal there about whether or not these two things are doing, doing the same thing. And finally, maybe the gold standard for um, some code generation tasks is executable evaluation. So, um, again, this is one of the special properties of code that we're, we're seeing this leverage here for the first time, um, that we can execute our code against, say, some reference test cases, and then we can tell, um, is it passing, is it failing? Um, now, this requires um, a sandbox to do this safely because you're generating kind of completely unknown model-generated code, so you want to make sure that you're doing this in a way that it's not going to affect the rest of your um, you know, the code that you've got stored um, anywhere else and that it, it, it's kind of isolated. Um, and it also requires an unambiguous problem statement. So uh, in order to be able to reliably execute my model's code, I have to tell it how I'm going to execute it. Um, because say, you know, I'm going to execute in my test case the, the function foo. Um, if, my gener if my model generates something in a function called bar, then uh, it's going to get zero on the test cases, even if the implementation is correct. So you have to be specific in the way that you are specifying these things in order to um, test them correctly, um, which is fine, but also can sometimes be at odds with the way that we use models in the real world. Um, if I'm using a language model to generate my code, I don't necessarily care what the function is called. I care about um, that, that it generates something at all. Um, and so this can kind of, um, there's a tension there between fully specified so that we can execute it and we know exactly what to do with it and use that structure versus not wanting to be too structured um, in general and also wanting to measure this kind of ambiguous thing. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. And then um, as a part of that unambiguous specification, um, sometimes we can show like, oh, here's an example of a test case that I'll, I'm going to test you on so that the model knows, uh, okay, I need to put my, you know, my code in a function and I need to have these variables, uh, these, these arguments and return a certain type. Um, and so there's this distinction between public test cases and private test cases. Um, public being that the model can see what's in the test cases, um, but we also need to be careful not to, like, to, to also withhold some private test cases so the model doesn't overfit its solution to um, the test cases because you're never going to be able to enumerate every possibility in test cases. Um, that's why you're generating a function. You want it to have, you know, this open-ended behavior. Um, so you want to make sure that it, um, is not just saying, you know, if the input is this, then I'll output that um, for, you know, enumerating all of your test cases. So having some private test cases um, to, uh, to uh, evaluate the model on is super useful. Um, and um, a couple of these um, uh, executable evals um, in the, their research papers, they showed actually very low uh, correlation between uh, what I had on the last slide, which was the semantic, um, you know, matching to a reference solution um, and this um, kind of functional correctness. Um, and I, I put just on the right here some examples of very common um, evaluations that people use that are under this category. And I would say most of the evaluations that I use in my day to day are, have this kind of um, execution test cases um, flavor. So um, just to quickly go through human eval um, was one of the first uh, uh, human eval and apps were some of the first um, executable benchmarks that people released in 2021. Um, and human eval, contrary to the name, no humans are harmed during this eval. Um, it's just because humans wrote the, the, the evaluations in the first place. They wrote the test cases and um, the prompts and everything. They're, they're human sourced, but it's really just automated you know, test cases for uh, function generation. Um, and then a lot of the other um, um, 
evaluations beyond this look like um, trying to address some of some of the issues with maybe low coverage. So Eval Plus synthetically generates a lot more test cases um, to go with um, like things like Human Eval um, to make sure that we are testing like a high coverage um, space of test cases. Um, there are some competitive programming um, benchmarks with this flavor. Um, Sweebench is uh, uh, looking at this kind of uh, executable correctness, but in a full repository. Um, can you fix, localize and fix errors in a repository? Um, uh, and then um, there's some data science focused ones like DS1000 and Arcade. Uh, class eval focuses on, like it sounds, classes. And then Live Code Bench is one that came out you know, somewhat recently. Um, and it's interesting because um, human eval, which for a lot of the, uh, the time is what most people would, would use to differentiate these models, um, all of the solutions are on GitHub. And um, there's a lot of contamination, as you can imagine, that goes on when you train your model on all of you know, GitHub. Um, that uh, means that you can't reliably trust um, this, even if you try like decontamination things, because maybe variable names are different. Um, and so Live Code Bench um, continually updates a leaderboard in real time so that you can actually look at, for certain cutoff dates, um, what, uh, how does the model perform. And a lot of the times you will see like a, a drop off after a model's you know, training day or something like that. Um, so figuring out ways to reliably test the code these model writes is, is quite a lot of, um, work and very rewarding work. So um, that's kind of the overview of some of these um, um, metrics. And finally, when we're measuring correctness um, as per test cases, because code is so specific, you can imagine all of the space of, let's say, the vector space of all of the code that you could write. And so that um, code that is similar to each other in, you know, say, token space that is close together. And then if you look at, you know, the correctness landscape of this, um, even one token that you have off might cause a sharp drop off so that um, uh, your, 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 um, your solution is almost correct. It's literally one token away, but that one token that's causing an error, that's causing all of your test cases to fail, and so you're getting absolutely no signal from this. Um, so a lot of the times, because this is such a difficult task, what people re will report instead of just my model passed or failed is this pass at K metric, which came out with the human eval benchmark. Um, and it's basically what it sounds like. Instead of generating one solution, I generate, I have my model generate K solutions. Um, and then I look at, do any of those pass? Um, and you, if you're using different values of K, which is what's shown on this plot here, um, you might want to use a different temperature so that you're, you're creating more diverse samples if you have a high K. Um, versus if you only have one shot, you probably want to get your model to output the thing that it's most sure is correct um, and doesn't have that temperature. And hybrids of these kind of evaluation schemes are possible, and I think we need to do that for all of these different kinds of code that we might want our models to tackle. Um, so you can imagine uh, making the human judgment, uh, making the human's job a little bit less tedious by maybe I, I have some test cases and I execute the code on them and then the human can inspect the behavior or uh, maybe there's not predefined test cases but the human has the ability to, you know, write a test for the model or interact and say, well, what's the, what's the output if I do this um, and test those things. Uh, same thing with model judgment or even uh, you can uh, uh, you use, you know, that execution output somehow it, to compare reference solutions as well. So um, this is kind of the general space, but I imagine a lot of these things are actually going to be stronger together to, to measure the capabilities of our models. Um, and getting a little bit more into some of the methods. Um, so this, this, this portion of the talk is structured very much like um, we've got LLM recipe. Um, so the standard recipe for LLMs is you know, pre-train them on a large corpus of data, instruction tune them on some smaller, but still, you know, somewhat large, high quality data, um, do maybe some RLHF to kind of um, directly correct some of the model's um, mistakes or, or shape its behavior in some way. And then we have inference time methods like um, best of n, where you can sample multiple things and then choose the best one, or um, retrieval augmented generation, which is basically just when you um, find either heuristically or the model finds some context um, to put um, for a specific generation um, so that it, um, 
it, it, you're kind of prompting it in a certain way to get a good answer. And you can retrieve that based on like similarity of you know, a database of solutions to the, the problem that you're currently using. Um, search or kind of tool use at, at inference time. So all these things that once you've already trained the model and the weights are fixed that we can do to, um, to get the best behavior out of our model. And then you can basically do all that, but for code. Um, and yeah, it basically looks like what you would expect. You pre-train your LLM on a large corpus of code data. Um, you instruction tune on some code data. Um, you do RLHF on code prompts. Um, that'd be quite a boring talk if that's all I discussed. Um, but that is most of the pipeline. So um, just kind of putting, putting that out there and um, so we can understand that this is mostly very similar. Um, but there's also some specific challenges that we run into when we're using models for code generation because of um, the, the specific challenges of writing code. So um, we need you know, models that can handle really long contexts for understanding what is going on in the rest of my repository or um, that can fill in the middle, not just kind of generate left to right. Um, but you, usually when you're programming, you want to um, go back and, and write code um, between uh, some other parts of the repository. Um, and then like I said previously, a lot of times we need to create many samples because um, the, this property of like the sharp drop off of correct code solutions. Um, but we also get, and I would say I'll, I'll probably focus a bit more on this, some code specific opportunities. Um, primarily with code execution that um, uh, we, can, we can execute the code and we can use that signal for data filtering, um, for optimization signals, for synthetic data generation, for inference time uh, feedback. Um, so you can imagine the model uh, debugging its own code and getting feedback from a, a compiler to say, no, no, that's not right, try it again. Um, and you can optimize the code performance, um, things like um, the speed of the code, the latency. So this is kind of the, the basic area and kind of Going back to the standard recipe, the, the main thing that we're going to need is some data. Um, and so probably one of the most obvious data sources is uh, we're lucky enough to live in a world where open source code is, um, is, is available um, and primarily all in one place. Um, so uh, actually on GitHub we have 300 million open source public permissively licensed repositories. This is the data as of 2023 from their kind of um, state of the uh, Octoverse report. Um, and so that's you know, a really, really great starting point to, to leverage all of the open source code that humans have written um, and, and understand um, yeah, what it takes to kind of write that, that kind of code. Um, and there's different structures that we can have for this data as well. So you can imagine like the, the most obvious thing is just the plain code tokens um, as they come, uh, but also there's some special metadata on GitHub um, and um, you can leverage something like the, the transformation of code and um, GitHub is not one kind of static thing, but um, there's also issues that people report and people add pull requests, so it's changing all the time. And so there's kind of dynamic flavors, things that you can leverage um, to get um, data in that way as well of this kind of like, how do I transform a piece of code? So other data sources um, and kind of we, we uh, most of these data sources, uh, you would need to either you know acquire some sort of license or um, pay for in some way. But just to kind of for completeness, so we can understand what what are all the kind of you know code. What is the code data that exists? Um, there's things like competitive programming competitions, uh, academic materials like coding lectures, boot camps, exercises, um, Stack Overflow, where we've got a lot of. Um, uh, great conversation about uh, code and questions and solutions and things like that. Um, you can also purposely like use human data generators to um, create your own data. Um, uh, and then there's, I would say, a lot of the world's code lies in enterprise software. Um, obviously, that's you know not readily available in most cases. Most of these things, like I said, are not. But maybe if you have a company that you have a lot of enterprise software um, and then you want to build some tools on it, that's also potentially a good data source. So, OK, let's say you have your code data and now you want to train your model. Um, one question that you might ask is, should I just train on the code data or should I um, start with 
Um, should I mix it with kind of natural language data? Should I start with a foundation model? Um, so there's this question of like, is there a transfer? Like, is it, is it worthwhile to turn on natural language data if all I care about is code? Um, and so um, I think this is kind of a back and forth in some ways, but um, the way that things kind of stand right now, I think um, most people are converging on this idea that, that yes, starting from a foundation model is usually a, a useful thing to do. If you think about like when we write code, especially if we want to write code that adheres to some natural language specification, it's useful to understand what that's saying. And um, there's a lot of um, you know, reasoning um, behavior in, in natural language data that we can maybe use to um, help write our code. Um, and a, a somewhat related question is, um, should we create one model for you know, to do everything? Or is there any merit to creating a code specialist model? Um, and I think there are a lot of code specialist models right now, um, because if all you care about is code, then you can use your model capacity just for that, then you can get, tend to get better performance. Um, so um, there is a benefit to creating these kind of code specialist models. On here is the code llama diagram. They actually have, uh, in this paper, they released um, not only a code specialist model, but then a code instruction specialist model and a code Python specialist model to really get the most for the applications that they care the most about. So obviously this depends on your use case and, and what you care about because there's trade-offs with these things, um, but, but that can be a useful thing to do. Uh, one, re run, one reason that you might want to put your code data into your normal model is that there also is kind of a transfer going the other way. So uh, training on code tokens improves you know, your reasoning capabilities in other non-coding tasks. This goes back to that kind of um, Steve Jobs quote that I had at the beginning about coding teaching you how to think. So one other thing to consider when you've got your code data and you're wanting to kind of start this, this LLM training um, is that code data availability varies a lot by language and also probably by a lot of other things, but language is the most maybe glaringly obvious one. There's a lot of you know, Python data, but not as much Haskell. Um, and so balancing the programming language distribution can help performance on rare languages by a significant amount. So like on average, uh, you know, 12% higher pass at K. Um, and there's a trade-off here of, I think, the, the improvement on these rare languages is like a lot. It's like 50% or something. I can't remember the exact number. Um, but the, the you know, high, high availability languages drop a little bit, um, which is kind of what you would expect if you're doing this kind of balancing. So all just considerations to think about. But if you want a kind of code generalist model, then this is something that you might be interested in doing because um, you don't want your model to think that coding just looks like Python. Um, so another thing, another kind of consideration when you're formatting your data, you're, you're bringing things together is infilling, um, which can allow you to train your model to do more than this kind of simple like left to right um, generation, but to fill in the middle between code contexts. Um, so that's useful for if you're building a, a in IDE code completion um, tool or you know repository level coding tasks where you need to edit um, code. And models don't um, out of the box have this kind of capability. Um, because most of the data that they're trained on is this kind of left to right flavor. So specifically, um, formatting your data in this way so that the model knows you know, where it can, how it can infill, uh, how it can break this kind of causality sometimes that we're used to in most other language data um, can, can um, improve performance on a lot of um, coding benchmarks. Um, now we'll get into a kind of a case study on competitive programming. So um, I talked a lot about um, the human eval benchmark previously, uh, which is a very kind of like maybe entry level programming. Like I, it, it's a it's a function generation thing, um, and what's nice about it is it's self-contained. It's quite a saturated benchmark now, um, and competitive programming is kind of one step. Um, beyond in some ways, because you still have a very well-defined problem. You still have somewhere where you have a lot of data sources um, and you can execute it reliably because you know what the format of the problem is, um, but the problems range in difficulty to being much, much harder. So competitive programming, I think, has been around since like the 1970s, um, and it's exactly what it sounds like. You're kind of dueling uh, other people to see how you compare on, on generating code for very hard problems. And there's often a lot of like um, time and memory constraints for these. I put an example problem up here. Um, I, I won't go into reading it, but um, it ba basically these word problems that specify um, some you know, varying level 
specification, give some example input and output. And then like I was talking about with the public and private test cases previously, um, there are a lot of websites like Code Forces which host these competitions. Um, and then you can um, go in and submit your solutions. You can submit like a certain number of solutions. Um, and they have some private test cases that you as the programmer are not allowed to see so that you don't hack your solution. You can be sure your solution is generally tacking, tackling whatever the kind of function, um, the desired functionality is. Um, so this is an external um, competition that you know people are participating in, and that's often a really good way to structure um, some of some machine learning research because you have this kind of gold standard um, and this uh, external judging factor that um, can help you really understand: Are we making progress with these models? So. Um, over the last couple of years, there's been, um, from some of my colleagues at uh, DeepMind, um, this competitive programming with AlphaCode effort. Um, and uh, here is kind of the diagram um, of that system. And we'll go into like a few different components of the system so we can understand um, how we've, um, yeah, how, how, the, how they've um, been successful at competitive programming. Um, and so first, zooming into the top kind of block here, the, the basic um, structure is, uh, the top is kind of this general fine tuning, um, like we've seen, and then the bottom is what we're doing at sampling and evaluation time, um, and that's where we can leverage some of the um, ex code execution properties um, to, to make the most use of our data. Um, and so this is the kind of zoom, zoomed in on that top component from the last slide, um, looking at the fine tuning stage. So um, as we were saying before, starting from um, the generalist language model base, uh, so starting in this case from Gemini Pro, um, and then doing a couple of different stages of fine tuning to create a family of models um, on a, a competitive programming data set uh, from code forces called code contests, uh, which is basically a lot of examples of this structure of data. Um, uh, with a lot of solutions per problem. Um, and they also use this, um, this objective called GOLD, uh, which is basically an offline RL objective. So instead of doing kind of maximum likelihood uh, next token prediction, um, in code we have, and especially in competitive programming, like there's a lot of, because we have so many solutions per data point and there's uh, a lot of different ways that you could answer the question, some of them might be easier for the model to do, some of them might be farther away from what the model is able to do. Um, and we only really need one solution that works. So the, the objective of this is to create like any, is to get any solution that you know, passes the test. Um, you don't need to cover the entire distribution. And so what this does is this adds a weighting term onto um, your maximum likelihood loss that basically weights things that the model was already going to, you know, had some likelihood of predicting and then downweights something that it wasn't going to predict in the first place. So it has this kind of, um, this, this flavor of looking at like the, what the policy was, was going to do in the first place. Um, and that allows it to focus and really focus on the precision instead of the recall um, to get um, good solutions but not worry about getting every possible right solution because that's not what we actually care about. Um, and so there's two phases of fine tuning here on like uh, a, a larger data set and then a data set that is made sure to be like very, very high quality that has the same kind of structure. Um, and then you have these kind of models um, and then where actually a lot of the kind of uh, success comes from actually is this next phase of sampling and evaluation. Um, so looking at um, taking in the problem, at, this is at you know, test time, you're try you have this competitive program problem, you're wanting to submit some solutions. Um, you can take your models and then do a lot of samples. So in this case, uh, looking at something like one million samples per problem. Um, and so you get you know, one million examples uh, from this different family of models. And the, the, I don't think I said this on the last slide, but the purpose of doing this like, family of, of fine-tuned models as opposed to just one model um, is that you get you know, more diversity um, in, the, in the generations that you might get. Um, they sample um, for C++ specifically. Um, uh, trying to, they basically tag, they say, I want a C++ solution um, because that tends to be the most efficient of the solutions in the training data. Um, and then what they do is they can execute um, these solutions uh, on the public test cases and potentially some synthetically generated test cases. So um, you have the input and output of these programs and you can use that to create clusters of, um, of solutions uh, because you're only allowed to submit a certain amount um, and so you can't submit all one million because that would be 
Um, you, you could just kind of submit anything at that point. And so you need to make some decisions about um, what solutions are, are useful. Um, so you can at least create these clusters to get this kind of diverse um, set of, of solutions. Um, and then you can use a fine-tuned reward model to choose which of these is most likely to kind of um, pass the, the hidden tests as well and re-rank them and then finally submit them to the competition to be uh, truly evaluated. So this is the solve rate compared to the sampling budget. Um, and I, I don't know if I mentioned this, there was two kind of iterations of Alpha Code. One was in um, 2022, the last one, late 2023. Um, and you can see um, this kind of sampling budget per problem. Uh, and there's no sign of slowing down either. Um, you have a million um, problems and then the solve rate kind of keeps, um, a million samples and the solve rate keeps increasing. Um, so this is the solve rate on uh, recent context. So getting about 40% um, when you have these million samples, um, which may not sound like um, much, but um, this is actually um, 87th percentile for uh, all kind of human competitors in these competitions. So this is actually very, very top level um, for competitive programming, um, which is quite an uh, exciting milestone. Um, and actually, just last night, um, OpenAI dropped uh, the O1 model, and they have this as kind of one of the benchmarks they've used. Um, and this, the, the graph on the right is showing kind of GPT-40 uh, and uh, how um, O1 model compares to that by using, again, a lot of this inference time compute um, to, to get a correct solution. Um, and so I think I have one more. Um, and yeah, so the, the, um, you can see the sample budget here um, and how, how things scale as you have a higher sampling budget, they scale better. Um, and so this is a really great tool, but obviously this is a super expensive thing to do. Um, and in both of these cases, this is a super expensive thing for, um, to do for any kind of everyday use case or something where you're not trying to you know, win this one competition. Um, and so I think a lot of the challenges is gonna be to figure out how we can actually do this in a more efficient, cheap way um, and kind of um, be able to scale up our inference time compute without just breaking the bank. Um, and now I'm gonna get into a bit of further like optimization behind human data. We got a bit of a flavor of it with the um, alpha code, with the way that we're selecting uh, and kind of optimizing at test time. Um, but we're still using, in that sense, like all, all basically human data. Um, and I think we can do really amazing things when we go beyond that. Um, so looking at optimization beyond human data, um, I have a couple of kind of uh, case study examples here. So this first one is called Alpha Dev um, from 2023. Um, uh, also from some of, some of my colleagues, um, discovering faster so sorting algorithms. So basically, um, you can use reinforcement learning um, to optimize for um, not only correctness, but also program latency. Um, and starting from, uh, in this case, the, they kind of set up this game um, where the actions are generating lines of assembly code uh, and the states are um, kind of the program th this thus far and then also the current state of the CPU um, to see that what's going on. And the reward is, is this combination of uh, correctness and low latency. Um, and what they discovered is that they can actually uh, cover, um, find a faster sorting algorithm than humans had found um, to do this thing. This is now integrated into the um, standard sorting library for C++. Um, and this is kind of, I think, the first time this library had been touched in, uh, this, this sorting library, this function had been touched in like 10 years. Um, so this is quite um, an exciting thing that um, there are, you know, glimmers of moving beyond um, what we can do with, uh, as humans. Um, Another example of this um, is this paper called Fun Search, which stands for kind of function search, um, which this is taking a completely frozen model, um, so not doing any training in contrast to the last one, just doing RL. Um, and the goal is to find better solutions for um, these in kind of case study on these cap set and bin packing problems, which are um, very hard mathematics problems, um, by evolving the solution generating program uh, using few shot prompting of a pre-trained code LLM. So basically um, starting with kind of a specification, um, they take a prompt uh, and they have, they record any previously um, successful, um, uh, successful solution. And the thing about these, um, 
these, this class of problems is that there's an evaluation that um, is a sliding scale and basically uh, there, there's, um, you can get more, more and more points um, and they, they were able to um, create new um, solutions to these problems um, by simply prompting with um, a, a few shot, like increasing, you know, this, here's one solution that's okay, here's another solution that's even better, now, you know, what can you do? And basically using the LLM as a source of diversity, um, a kind of a, a diverse solution generating thing, and then because we have this um, evaluation function that we can just run and check um, and get, get verified, um, we can use that to uh, actually create um, new solutions. So the kind of interesting component there to me, at least, is this, um, this executable verification function that we can then use to create better and better solutions. Um, and there's other um, work on execution-based reinforcement learning. So there's this paper called PPO Coder, uh, which trains an RL agent to generate code with a combination of rewards, that, and that includes compiler feedback. So like, if you have test cases, do they pass? Um, does the, is there an error signal? Um, and as well as some combination of syntactic and semantic matching to the correct solution. So this actually in practice looks like um, getting the abstract syntax tree or data flow graph. So I think earlier I mentioned these multiple representation levels that we can have of these programs. Um, and if we can match um, those things more, then we can, um, we, we talked about this in terms of evaluation, but a lot of the times what we find is that um, a lot of the things that we do in evaluation are also equally as valid to do in training. So we can use the compiler feedback and the test case generation as a signal um, that we can then optimize to create um, correct and um, cor correct code um, as per the test cases and also as per um, closeness to some reference solution, uh, as well as the KL penalty. So they, they actually found that the compiler feedback is the weakest of these rewards in terms of their ablations. It didn't help as much as the, the other um, rewards, um, but it does still make an impact, and I think this line of work is super um, exciting for seeing how things um, can progress uh, as we go forward. Um, now, we'll get into repository level coding, so everything that I've kind of talked about and done case studies on up to this point is um, very uh, self-contained, well-defined problems. Um, but a lot of the times that's not how, actually say so probably most of the time, that's not how we actually write code. Um, we, we usually go into a code base that's existing and sometimes maybe not um, you know, the cleanest or the most well-documented, and then we need to make changes to this code um, in order to achieve our aims and then leverage other you know, libraries and leverage other uh, pieces of code um, so that we can achieve our aims. So now we're going into this kind of like repository level coding. Um, so in 2023, this uh, benchmark called Sweebench um, was created, and um, Sweebench basically sources task instances from real-world repositories from Python, from GitHub, um, and they basically take uh, GitHub issues and uh, pull requests, and they create this kind of um, uh, data set out of this, um, where basically this kind of evaluation data set. Um, where the goal is to basically go from issue to pull request so that the repository is passing whatever the failed tests are or whatever the issue was or whatever the new tests are. So the, the kind of um, the evaluation metric here is this uh, executable um, correctness on all of the test cases in the repository. This is a very hard problem. Um, and this is a very hard problem for a lot of reasons. So. Um, this is one requires ultra long context to be able to fit these repositories in memory so that you can um, usefully address the problem. And especially because a lot of the times bug finding is a very like needle in the haystack kind of issue. You have all of this code, but the, the problem is in one file that you need to, um, you need to first locate and then address. Um, and that requires, so that requires like, multiple steps of reasoning to be able to find, okay, What's the problem? Where is it? Wh what would solve it? Um, uh, and that's not something that's usually doable in kind of a single shot thing. So this, a lot of the times, requires um, more agentic type of models that can uh, interact um, for multiple steps with some sort of uh, environment. Um, this also requires um, uh, generating data in a patch format, um, and it, this is a different format than a lot of um, other data is 
is in. So like even just generating this kind of um, diff for the models um, can be quite challenging. Um, so it's just less obvious than that, you know, maybe a contiguous format. And there's less data because each of these data points is very complex. So all of this together means that this is a very hard problem. Um, I think when they created this benchmark the um, in 2023, the, the highest performing model, which was Claude 2, is getting like less than 2% uh, on, on this benchmark. Um, now, um, we've, you know, as a community made a lot of progress. Um, and now have about um, you know 22 percent on the this is the leaderboard as of um, yesterday on the um, SWE bench uh, benchmark and so you can go in at any time check um, how, how models are performing on this benchmark um, and so there's been kind of a lot of rapid progress made um, for these models uh, on on SWE bench uh, despite all these challenges so um, working on hard problems is usually once you specify the problem again going back to evaluation. Um, it kind of rallies a lot of people around trying to solve it. Okay, so we've gotten through a, quite a few case studies. Um, so now I re really briefly want to talk about um, what's next. Um, so we are um, looking back at kind of what I've just presented. We've had a lot of rapid improvement um, in the last you know, couple of years. Code generation has absolutely taken off in a lot of ways. Um, we could have only dreamed of, you know, five years ago. Um, and there's amazing capabilities that lie inside of these models. Um, but lowering the cost and the inference time uh, compute and sampling um, is going to be key to scaling impact. I think um, this is true of the AlphaCode system. This is also true of the um, O1 model. Um, I, I think um, generally... That's how progress gets made a lot of the times is um, you do something, you know, no matter what it takes to, no matter how expensive it is, and then try to um, consolidate that knowledge and improve um, that. Um, there's also room for improvement. Like, even though we made drastic progress on, on Bench, it's still very, um, very low compared to a lot of software engineers. And um, uh, on these natural, more real world software engineering tasks, there's a lot of room um, to go. Um, and there's more room, I would say, to fully leverage these special properties of code that we're talking about and putting them in every kind of stage of this pipeline um, and optimizing them to their full potential. Um, these kind of code execution or multiple layers of representation that we have for codes. Um, and I talked about this a little bit during evaluation, but especially as we um, add you know, code execution to more and more parts of the pipeline, one thing... Um, that we should really keep in mind is the safety of executing that code. So um, having proper protocols for executing that code in um, uh, isolated sandboxes, um, as well as be under, being mindful that the code that the model generates is not always right and could be, potentially be harmful, especially when you're doing things like displaying that code to users. Um, so um, yeah, o o always kind of keeping that in mind. Um, and so we're back where we started, and um, I think code generation um, will kind of help us continue to make progress in machine learning. Um, and I hope it served as a useful lens to understand some of the more, uh, so, so some of the lessons from this week. Uh, I really appreciate your attention. I think we have about 10 minutes now for questions. Thank you.